Okay, I'll just I'll just continue from the uh, comments. So, um, yeah, the the first comment I saw, what uh, they they said, I'm in no way religious, but I absolutely love this advert. Uh, what a fantastic message for those who can only hate those who are different. Uh, another writes, words can't express how much I love this commercial. Instead of hating each other, let's love one another. And a third, why couldn't the world be like this, eh? Maybe, just maybe one day. And perhaps this is your desire too. We like to describe religion with analogies that put them all on a level playing field, that highlight the similarities and gloss over the differences. We like to say there are many paths up the mountain, and it doesn't matter which one you're on as long as you're, uh, you keep moving towards the top. Or perhaps you've heard the story of uh, the blind men who are sent from the village to investigate an elephant and report back on what this creature is like. Um, presumably it's previously uh, the village has not encountered it. So one of the blind men, they grasp at the trunk uh, and they say it's a little like a snake. Another grasps at the leg and says it's it's a little like a tree trunk. Uh, and so they go around blindly uh, touching different parts of the elephant, uh, describing it, trying to trying to describe what this elephant is like. And the point of these analogies is that to say that any one religion has the right way, the true understanding of life, the universe or God is reductive at best and intolerant or arrogant even at worst. It's saying that all religions are equally right in their own ways, grasping a little bit of the picture, making their own way up what is ultimately the same mountain. Or perhaps even we would like to say that they're all equally wrong. The thing with these analogies, though, is that you have to be at the top of the mountain to know that all paths lead up to it. You have to be able to see the elephant to know that each of the blind men are, are describing an aspect of the same animal. I don't want to disparage the desire for harmony and peace. It's a noble desire. It's something good that I hope that we all deeply long for. But while these descriptions of religion seem to promote tolerance, in reality, they're, the, they're guilty of that same reductive thinking and arrogance that they accuse religion, which makes claims to exclusive truth. And maybe I don't have to work so hard to convince you of that in today's climate. Serious differences quite clearly exist between different religions and worldviews, and, and they're irreconcilable. The Christian insistence that Jesus is God can't be reconciled with the Muslim faith. And saying to a Christian that he isn't God only a prophet is offensive. And just imagine if the Amazon ad that I spoke of at the start uh, instead featured someone in a Make America Great Again cap sitting down with someone in a Black Lives Matter t-shirt. Perhaps then it would have been a little less believable. And it certainly would have lost its weight had they not covered the conversation with moving piano music and we had heard instead a debate about who Jesus is. We can value each other and show each other respect but that doesn't mean that there aren't serious differences in belief between Muslims and Christians, for instance. In fact, respecting each other involves recognizing those differences. It's nothing short of a form of Western cultural imperialism to say to each of us that we must suppress the core aspects of our faith that make us different and to say that these are just superficial differences, that we should instead focus on the, on the really deep differences like the fact that we kneel to pray. Maybe we're all blind like the men in the story. But then we have to accept the idea uh, that that includes all of us. Not one of us is in the position of seeing the elephant. What we really need, if we have any hope at knowing the truth, is not another human coming to us, claiming that they can see and giving us their blind take on the universe, on God. We need the elephant to speak. We need God to make himself known. And this is where I think the Christian faith is not only unique, but offers something truly good and beautiful. All religions have their special person, their prophet or founder who claims to have discovered a better way, to have his or her eyes opened to the realities of life and God. All of them, humans looking up the mountain or maybe claiming to have made it some way, uh, a good way up to the summit. But the Christian claim is radically different. God himself came to us and opened our eyes to him, revealing what we cannot discover about reality through our own blind investigation. 
The starting point for Christianity isn't a human front man, but God showing himself to us in a way that we can grasp in our metaphoric blindness by becoming human, by becoming one of us. He became a man, Jesus, in time and space, in a way that we could see, that we can investigate historically, which, by the way, if you do that, you'll find that 2,000 years of critical scrutiny has uh, strengthened rather than weakened this claim. See, Jesus is a unique frontman of the religion. Jesus claims the position of God, not pointing to one way among many, but that he himself is the way. He's not just an enlightened one, but the light himself, not just a teacher sent from God, but God himself come. And this uniquely Christian claim is not that we can know God through our own efforts at greater insight or through following a particularly enlightened religious leader, but that God, by his own initiative and action, has made himself knowable and known. The only one that we can truly guarantee is at the top of the mountain has come down to us and showed us the way to the top, even laid himself down to be the way itself. And this leads to another unique aspect of the Christian claim. What Jesus offers is not a way to earn God's favour, but the gift of God's favour itself that we could never earn. All other religions say that you are accepted based on your performance. They tell us that there are certain things that we must do to be accepted, to achieve a level of worthy existence, or to become our true or best selves. They may give vastly different things to do or different goals to achieve, but ultimately they're still performance based. Even our basic human nature and drive follow along these same lines. We respond well to advertising that sells the latest and best way to become the better you. And surely you know the feeling with university exams and assignments that wells up this perfectionism uh, that's driven by our mentality that if we could just achieve a little bit more, we'd be okay. But Jesus shows us a God that is far beyond our hope of reaching through our performance. He shows us that really we are helpless, but he doesn't leave us there. God isn't aloof, but comes down to meet us as we are. No other religion makes that claim. Eternal life is given through Jesus as a gift, not a reward for achievement. The order is completely reversed. It's not about us grasping at God, hiking optimistically up the mountain, desperately trying to form a mental picture of an elephant that we cannot see. But God descending to us to embrace us and bring us up to himself through what he does. The story of every other religion is struggling to reach God. The story of Christianity is that Jesus loves you enough to reach down to you and give you a gift that you could not could never earn. This is a mess message of rest from personal striving. All other religious systems are roughly based around a do this to make it. Jesus says it is done. Jesus doesn't come up with a way for us to make up for our own shortcomings and make ourselves better for God. He himself does the work of making up for those shortcomings. We are brought to him, uh, we are brought to God in Jesus so that we can be transformed and fulfilled. See, it's only after receiving the free gift of God do you then change. This is a crucial difference in order. It's realistic about our weakness and our brokenness, and it provides heaps of grace for when we fail. It's why Christians talk about their faith as good news, receiving acceptance before improving yourself, and having acceptance that isn't based on your performance or success at being your best self is good news. It's not just unique, it's what we deep down know that we really need. So we resonate with the ads that try and sell us the new exercise regime uh, or a January diet plan that we always fail at or an environmentally conscious lifestyle, but because we want to be better, to be the best us, and we recognize that we aren't yet. But deep down, None of us want that to define us, who we are, our standing with other people or with God. That would crush us. What our souls need is to be loved, to be accepted in our present state, the way we are right now. We can't possibly hope to attain that ever shifting standard of good enough. I wonder if you would uh, just think for a moment about your experience of family, whether it's been good or not. I wonder if you can imagine uh, what it would be like to know that you're welcome 
that you belong no matter what. There's motivation in that to work hard, to achieve goals, celebrate success without feeling a fear of failing or uncertainty about whether you've ever done enough to belong. And we can sense whatever our experience was that that would be ideal. Our best experience of friendships is like this too. And our worst experiences of friendships where we have to perform to always be amazing or pretend that we're something we're not, show us how crushing that alternative is. When you're accepted by your friends with all your weaknesses and flaws, there's life in that friendship. You don't need to get rid of these before your friends will welcome you. They've got your back no matter what. But good friends still motivate us to do our best, to improve. They celebrate with us in our successes. They cheer us on on our attempts to better ourselves. They celebrate our achievements without making these the basis of our friendships. Isn't this what we all want in life? In our relationships, our friendships, our family? Isn't this the life-giving acceptance that we deserve? Why would religion be any different? And this is what Jesus offers. We are accepted, our destiny secured by Jesus before we achieve anything. In our weakness and failing, we're accepted because of what Jesus has done, his first move toward us, his shouldering the cost of forgiveness. And this in the most unexpected of ways, suffering on the cross in the face of intolerance and religious pettiness, meeting violent intolerance with humble mercy, rising from the dead to exhaust the power of violence entirely. One of the big problems we have with religion is power plays and violence, isn't it? And Jesus' move is utterly unique, not a power play, but a weakness play, you could say. It's the beginning point for the world of peace and love that we long for. It's not about hiding our weaknesses. It's not about finding ways to become our best self, to earn acceptance. It's not even about saying that we're already good enough in ourselves, pretending that somehow our character flaws and mistakes don't matter, even though inside we know that they do and we can't escape that feeling of not being good enough. Jesus is realistic about our present condition. He accepts us, welcomes us in that condition, but he doesn't leave us there. One of the first century biographies of Jesus, written by a man named John, says that he came full of truth and grace. Truth and grace to receive us as we are, and truth and grace to transform us into something better. Now, I know how this can sound. It's not an easy thing to receive, and it may sound great, but it's just not been your experience of Christians or churches. Maybe they've come across as just selling another version of a moral way of life, a way to work your way to God. Maybe that's why Christianity can often just look like other religions. And I'm, I'm truly sorry if that's been the case for you. I think that that is the case because this is so counter our normal way of thinking. Even for someone who's been a Christian for 20 years or so, this way round of things, this acceptance before performance is easy to forget. I need reminding of it regularly. I have a calligraphy print up on my uh, living room wall that says, we love because he first loved us. And it's, it's probably the cheesiest, most millennial thing I have in my house, maybe aside from the avocado in my fridge. But it's a quote from the Bible that is there because I myself need reminding every day that this is the good news that Jesus offers me. Everything else around me, in society, in advertising, on Netflix or Disney Plus, is telling me otherwise. It's telling me that I need to do better, to follow these three easy steps, to change my diet, to exercise more. If I just do that, I'll be good enough. The message of Christianity is so unique that I, after 20 odd years, still need daily reminders of it. And this good news is a game changer, utterly unique from the messages of all other religions and truly good for our souls. I'm accepted first. That brings peace and life. It removes any and all crushing expectation from me. I work to live as I should because of that acceptance, not to earn it. So how do you live in that reality? Well, you have to give up your own attempts to earn or achieve ultimate acceptance, success, fulfillment. You can't accept a free gift or unconditional love while you continue to apply conditions to your life, while you continue to try and earn it. 
but this gift is so worth giving up those attempts for. So will you at least explore this claim? If this sounds at all good or desirable to you, why not come and see for yourself? There's an old saying in English that we've shortened to, the proof is in the pudding. And I really like the full version. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. The point is that you know something is good only by tasting it. You can't just look at it from the outside. Why don't you come and taste and see for yourself that this offer of Jesus is in fact good. Don't just take my word for it. Don't just stay looking in. Whatever you do, please don't leave this gift unexplored. Whether this is the first time you've heard anything about this or not, you might have been to some, uh, some of the recent events put on by the CU uh, and you're interested, please explore this. What's stopping you from having this acceptance? We have a claim that's like nothing else out there. God meeting us in our arrogance and violence with unprecedented humility. Mercy towards those who could never deserve it, even to the point of him suffering death. All of this so that you can have exactly what your heart needs, acceptance in your weakness and grace to make you whole. If you wanna explore this more, then please do talk to someone in the CU. Maybe a friend invited you, talk to, talk to them. Uh, look at the, uh, the events that are coming up in the next few weeks and, and think about coming along to some more of those. Uh, and, and just explore this, please don't leave it unexplored. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, for your talk. So now we are going to move on the Q&A section. Again, like um, you are still welcome to post any questions to Slido. So yeah, so we are going to start now. So the first question is, isn't professing faith also something to do to gain God's favor? Does God really love everyone when people who don't believe will have eternal judgment? Well, thank you. That's a really great question. Uh, in fact, there's probably two questions in there. So let me take them one at a time. Um, I think this is something that Christians uh, can argue about a little bit. Is faith something that we do to gain uh, God's favor? I think, I think the reality is that that faith is in itself a gift to us. The the fact that God came to us and and gives us this uh, certainty that we can know Him um, isn't something that we work at. It's not something that I could achieve by thinking long enough or hard enough about. Uh, it's actually, so even faith itself is a gift. Um, it's not, uh, I think, I think we think of faith sometimes as, as just believing the right thing. I think it's something deeper than that. And um, it comes as a result of being encountered by Jesus. Um, and to the second question, does God really love um, all of us when, uh, does, does God really love everyone when people who don't believe will have eternal judgment? Um, I think what, what the Christian faith says, what Jesus tells us is that actually in our present state, we're all deserving of eternal judgment. It's not that that eternal judgment isn't predicated on whether you believe or not. It's, it's sort of the state that we're all in our, our standing for everyone before Jesus, uh, before God is, is that. And so, um, God's love to us is in providing that way out, in providing something that uh, is beyond our ability to grasp on our own, um, something that he provides. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question we have is, uh, to be able to say Christianity is true, surely you need to investigate every religion. How do do you not know something better out there? To say that Christianity is true, don't you need to investigate every religion? Uh, thank you. Yeah, that's a really great question. Again, um, I guess if you think about anything that you hold to be true, have you investigated every alternative possibility? Or have you just got to the point where you, you have enough evidence for that thing to be true that that other possibilities could even seem sort of absurd or um, 
you know, you, you have a strong enough amount of evidence in the positive. I think, I think the real, the root of that question is, can we know things positively or do we just have to rule out everything that's wrong and be left with whatever's left over? And I think the truth is that we can know things positively. I mean, it is good to investigate other claims and other religions and, and see which one holds up the most to scrutiny. But I think at some point to, to live with some kind of positive uh, worldview, you have to, you have to take them on their positive evidence, not just what you're left over with when you eliminate everything else. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one is, if we choose Christianity because it means acceptance before performance, are we not just choosing the easy way out? Is Christianity too good to be true? Yeah, thank you. That's a that's a brilliant question. Are we not just choosing the easy way out? Um, I think the easiest way out is possibly to say that as we're already good enough as we are, there's nothing we need to do. There's no change that needs to happen. So um, what, that doesn't necessarily answer the question, but but I'd like to yeah start by saying it's not the easiest way out. Um, although it, you know it could still seem like the easy way out. I think what's if you want something difficult about this claim, uh, it requires us to deny our own, even our own ability to achieve it ourselves. Um, maybe, maybe that is good and, and seems like an easy way out for those of us who are um, less uh, keen to do the work. But I think really we want to be, there's sort of a natural desire in us to be held up on our own merits, to to be recognized for what we're good at. So I think yeah, the, the offer to have acceptance that isn't based on that uh, is really good for us, but it does require a little bit of self, uh, self sacrifice and, and saying, actually, I'm going to deny myself. Um, and that's exactly what Jesus says to us. He says, to, to follow him, we have to deny ourselves, take up our cross, follow his way. Um, but it is it is good. And, and uh, I hope that you can see that it is good. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's too good to be true. I think it's just good enough to be true, if that makes sense. Okay. So yeah, this is the next question. It's the last question we have so far. So okay. what about other religions where the main person claims to be God? Off the top of my head, the only the only religions I can think of where the main person would claim to be God uh, are ancient religions like uh, ancient Egyptian religion, ancient Roman religion, where where the Pharaoh or the the Caesar is claims to be God, and in those cases, um, they're their claim to, to divine status is one that they have sort of earned by merit of who they are, their position, and they're, they're raised up to the position of God. I think Christianity's claim uh, is, is different to that. And uh, I think probably if there's, if there's a modern religion that has a similar claim, it will be along the same lines. A, a great human person is elevated to the status of God. Uh, Christianity's claim isn't that a great human person was elevated to the status of God. It's that God actually lowered himself to our status to be with us. Um, so I, I think, yeah, that, that's where the difference would be. So there's, there's, yeah, there's a, there's a, there seems to be a similarity there, but I think, I think it's only superficial really when you dig into it, uh, those directions will be what the really key difference is. Okay, so I think that's all the questions that we have. So thank you once again, Michael, to come and speak to us. And thank you for everybody who has joined our talk today.